Hello, welcome back. Uh, let's get started on lesson two, where we're actually going to do the work of calibrating the model. So in lesson one, we were able to assess that our models were not particularly well calibrated. So how do we fix it? Well, the first step is we need a calibration data set. And there's two ways generally to do this. One is to, at the beginning, leave out some data for calibration. And that's very simple, but the downside is that you need to use a separate data set and any data that you use for calibration is data you don't have to train your model. So you have that tension there. It's great if you have plenty of data, then it's not that big a deal. The second approach is a bit more complicated, takes more time, but it's more data efficient. And that's to do cross-validated predictions on the training data. So we had a model and we fit it on our entire training data set. Now what we're going to do is we're going to divide that training data into five folds and train the same model with the same parameters on four out of the five folds and then make predictions on the fifth fold. And do this five times each time, leaving out a different fold. So now we have a set of predictions on everything in the training data set. And all of those predictions came from a model which did not see that training data. So the, we can then take those set of scores and the set of outcomes and treat that as our calibration data set. Now, the, the one sticky point is that the models that created those predictions are a little bit different than the actual model we're going to use to, put, to apply this calibration to. So we're using these models that were trained on four out of five folds, and we're assuming that the calibration that works across those five different models will work for our fully trained model that was fit on all five folds. So we're sort of taking on faith that the models trained on four out of five folds are not going to be too different than the models that were trained on all five folds. And if the calibration fixes the problems in these four out of five models, it'll fix the same problems in the overall model. So, so those, are, those are the two options for getting a calibration data set. We're going to start out, we're going to go through the methods of um, using just an independent calibration set, and then we're going to redo them using this cross-validated approach. Now, once we have the calibration data set, we have to decide what method of calibration to use. And again, this is just, all these algorithms are essentially saying, I've got this data of scores and outcomes, and I'm going to try to fit some function to that relationship. And then when I use the model in the future, after I get my answer, I'm going to run it through this extra function that calibrates it and use that as my final answer. So the four methods that we're going to go through are called plat scaling, beta calibration, isotonic regression, and spline calibration. Plat sca scaling and isotonic regression have been around for a while. Beta calibration and spline calib are relatively new, uh, you know, last three or four years. And so first we're going to go through these with this independent calibration set. So we already did that when we first started. We set aside 5% of our data for calibration. So we've got a data set of about 3,000 points on which to do our calibration. So let's run them through. So let's now take our model and we're going to make the predictions on both the calibration set and on the test set and have those uh, answers lying around. So this refers to the, the raw predictions of the model on the calibration set and the raw predictions of the model on the test set. And the first method we're going to talk about is called plat scaling. Plat scaling is quite simple. It assumes that there's a logistic relationship between the score Z and the true probability p. So it's essentially saying, let's just fit a logistic regression to that relationship. So there's two parameters, and we're going to fit them just like in logistic regression. Um, so this is very simple and straightforward. Um, it needs very little data, because you're only fitting two parameters. But the downside is that it's a very restrictive set of possible functions. If the true relationship is a logistic or close to it, this will do quite well. If it is not, 
uh, logistic relationship, this is going to do kind of poorly. Um, now, historically, this idea came from the observation and some theoretical arguments that for support vector machines, a logistic uh, relationship would fall out naturally uh, for the scores outputted by the support vector machines. So I don't think it was intended to be used quite so generally, but then people used it more generally and found a lot of times it does okay, and so they, they kept using it. So to fit plat scaling, we're just going to use the scikit-learn logistic regression function. Um, and you'll see this big number for C. So one, one snag with scikit-learn logistic regression, there's no unregularized version of the logistic regression. The logistic regression function in scikit-learn by default does some coefficient shrinkage. And that's controlled by this parameter C. And the, the way it works is a bigger C means less regularization. So to try to turn off regularization completely, you just set C to a really, really, really big number. So that's what we're doing here. So we fit it very quick. And now we're going to take our uncalibrated probabilities and pass them through this logistic regression function to get our calibrated probabilities. And then next we're going to say, OK, let's look at the reliability diagram on the calibration set and see how well our curve fit this calibration data. So these dots represent the, the calibration data. Now, now remember, in reality, the data are actually all zeros and ones, but that would be kind of silly to look at. So what we do is we take this reliability diagram, we do that same trick where we bin the data, and then compare the average x value in the bin to the average y value in the bin. And this gives us a sense of what the true relationship is. Now you'll see we only have 3,000 data points and remember that there's not that much data on the right hand side of the plot. So that's why the numbers are kind of jumpy over here on the right hand side. Um, but this is the curve it comes up with and you know it seems reasonable. You'll notice um, it, it starts above, it swings below, it goes above again, swings below. Now we're really uh, we're really constricted by this logistic form so it, it kind of has to do this thing where it, it kind of swings out and uh, it crosses the line again. And that we'll see, you know, can be a problem if, if the relationship is not truly logistic. So that's what it looks like on the calibration data. You see it does its best to fit these data points within the constraints of being logistic. And on the test set, well, the test set's a lot bigger, so the points are not as jumpy. And it's a better representation of what's truly going on. And so this is how the curve is fitting, you know, the, the, the test data at the end of the day. So we see, you know, it's okay, but it's, it's probably kind of under predicting here and then over predicting here and, you know, not, not perfectly fitting the data. This is now the reliability gram of reliability diagram of the calibrated uh, model. So how does this, we, we, in the previous lesson, we showed the reliability diagram before calibration. This is now the reliability diagram after calibration. And you can see it's okay, but there's a few points kind of outside the error bars. You seem to have systematic misses above the curve over here. This one down here seems quite below the curve and outside the range of confidence. Likewise over here. If we do it on the logit scale, we see that you know we're badly missing over here. Um, so that seems to be a, a pretty big flaw that, that now, because this curve is above this point, we are now missing this badly in this direction. But that's a qualitative analysis, so the simplest way to really get at numerically whether we improved or, or got worse versus the uncalibrated is to look at the log losses. And here we see that uh, it did, in fact, improve the log loss. So the log loss went down from 0.312 to 0.298. So we did improve ourselves uh, in log loss. 
Second method we'll cover is called isotonic regression. And the way isotonic regression works, it's basically fitting a piecewise constant monotonically increasing function between the scores and the probabilities. And it uses this algorithm called PAV or PAVA, which is pool adjacent violators. Um, and that describes how the algorithm works. It looks for cases, it basically builds up these steps by looking for places where it's not going in the right direction. What's nice about it is it does not assume a particular parametric form. So whereas logistic regression, plat scaling, and uh, also beta calibration, we'll see those both assume a particular parametric form. Isotonic regression does not assume any parametric form. Um, so it will tend to be better than plat scaling if you have enough data. The, the downside is it needs a lot more data because it's not making any assumptions about the functional form or making very few assumptions about the functional form. The other downside is that it does tend to overfit a little bit, tends to be a little bit choppy, and we'll see examples of this when we plot some of the curves. Um, because it's piecewise constant, it will sometimes have these very flat sections which then jump up uh, quite a bit in a, in a somewhat unrealistic way. <coughs> but let's check it out. So we uh, fit our isotonic regression. We make predictions on the calibration set and the test set. We plot the curve over the calibration data. And here you can see, um, you know, it's fitting the points pretty well. It's a little wiggly, but it's fitting the points pretty well um, down here where we have a lot of data. Remember, we have a lot of data on the left-hand side of this curve and, and less data over here. Then as we get to the right, we see it's, it's kind of missing and it has these very big jumps here and here. Um, so you can see what happened here. We have a, kind of the data in these four points fit this pattern. So it's trying to fit a piecewise constant. So it decided to be constant all through this stretch, all the way from like about 0.3 to almost 0.5. And then it jumped up. And then this step kind of corresponds to these two points. And so this is, again, what happens with isotonic regression in particular when it, it does not have a lot of data. Um, now, if we look at this is how it fit the data it was fit on. This is the calibration curve on the calibration data. Now, if we see what happens when we go to the test set, we'll see that you know some of those fits those places where it has these long flat, long flat steps and then a sharp jump up don't really fit the data that well. So we see on the test data where we have a much richer representation of what's really going on, it's really under predicting here and it's really under predicting here. And then it makes this big step at the end to try to catch up. So here's the reliability diagram on the calibrated model. And you see where we don't have any points in this whole range. And that's because of this step, that it steps up from this value, from this y value over here, this y value over here. So you basically don't have any data between about 0.35 and 5. And so that's why we have this sort of gap over here. Um, so we see some of the artifacts. Some bins, have, some bins have very few or no points because of those vertical steps. And then if we zoom in on the tails a little bit, um, you know, it's, we don't see, it's hard to see again from these diagrams, huge problems. This one doesn't particularly reveal any problems. If we go over here, I think you see that this one is a little bit under, under the curve, um, relative to the error bars. <coughs> but again, the best way to, uh, really see what's going on is to look at the, uh, log loss scores. And in this case, actually isotonic does worse than the uncalibrated. Um, and that's, I wouldn't say that's typical, but that can happen. Again, isotonic needs a lot of data. And so when it has a small amount of data, and this is 3,000 data points for, for a problem like this, 3,000 data points is not enough really for isotonic regression to get a good fit. Um, and so it is possible that it'll actually kind of make things worse. The third method we're gonna look at is called beta calibration. And per its authors, that's a well-founded and easily implemented improvement on logistic calibration for binary classifiers. And the authors took a look at 
plat scaling and they noticed a couple things. They noticed that because you're fitting a logistic curve, if the data is already calibrated, so imagine your data was already on the line y equals x, and you said, well, let me run it through the calibration anyway. Since logistic can't actually fit that straight line, it's actually going to make things worse. And so they said, that's kind of silly. So they came up with a three parameter family of curves given over here that includes the line y equals x. So if your data is already calibrated, beta calibration permits the line y equals x as one of the possible functions. So it won't mess it up if it's already calibrated. Here's the reference if you want to see more. Let's uh, put it into action. So here's the curve on the calibration set. And you see, you know, it, you can kind of see this extra degree of freedom it has relative to, to the logistic regression because it, the bends here are in different places than, than, than logistic regression would allow. Um, so that's how it looks on the calibration data. See on the calibration data, we're, we're a little bit below the line more. So I think it pulled this out a bit. When we look at the test data, you see it's pretty good, probably under predicting here in the middle um, and, and over here. So most of the more of the dots are above the line. So when we do the reliability diagram uh, post calibration, we see more dots above the line. So it's under predicting the true probabilities are for a large part of the curve above the line. And if we look at the tail, we see actually it's, it's, it's doing kind of poorly over here um, in the tails. And that might have implications because log loss doesn't really doesn't like it when you're off by a big factor on the tails. And in fact, we see, yeah, beta calibrated. It, it does improve from uncalibrated, but actually does a little bit worse than plat scaling. And I would say that that's unusual. Usually beta calibration will improve on plat scaling. Um, so again, don't read too much into the results of this particular trial. Uh, later, we'll go through a whole bunch of trials uh, and, and play around and you can kind of see. You want to evaluate these methods kind of overall on the big scale. The last method I'm going to talk about is called spline callip. Spline callip fits a cubic smoothing spline to the relationship between the uncalibrated scores and the calibrated and the true probabilities, I should say. Um, the way smoothing splines work is you have a loss function and that loss function considers two factors. One is it wants to fit the data well and the second is that you don't want the second derivative to be very big. So this nuisance parameter, at one extreme, it's going to revert to standard logistic regression. And at the other extreme, it'll be this very wiggly function that fits the data but doesn't generalize well. And spline callop automatically fits this nuisance parameter. So spline callop basically has to run a lot of logistic regressions and pick the one with the best nuisance parameter. Um, and because of that, it takes a little bit longer to run. So let's try it out. So we'll run it. You see it takes about 15, 20 seconds probably here to run. So while it's doing that, we'll do the next cell where it's going to make the predictions on both the calibration set and the test set. And then let's see the curve that gets fit. So here's the curve it fits on the calibration set. And you see it looks kind of similar to, to what beta calibration had, but um, you kind of see it, it, it's not constrained. So it stays below the curve the whole time and then only only comes back up again at the very end, you know, to, to kiss the point one one. Um, and down here, it's just a touch above the curve, which I think is justified by this this point over here. So we see when we get to the test set, it actually fits the test set, you know, fairly well, at least visually. I think it fits the test set the best of the four. Here's the reliability diagram. Um, 
of the, the, the calibrated model. So we see pretty much everything seems to be within the error bars, maybe the exception of this one over here. Um, and if we look at the logit scaled one, you know, again, looks pretty good. Almost all those dots look to be very, very close to the line. This one probably has very small data in it because the, the bin is so big. And when we look at the log losses, we see in this example, spline, spline calib uh, outperforms the competitors um, by a significant margin. Um, and again, it's not always going to be the case. I encourage you to run different examples and see what happens. Um, so on this example, spline calib does best. Beta calibration and plat scaling both do reasonably well, and they're much quicker to fit. On this one, isotonic does relatively poorly, but that's an indication of the fact that we only had about 3,000 points in our calibration set, and isotonic regression really needs a lot of data. You could also take a look at the Breyer score loss. And this is interesting because we see actually quite a different relationship between the different methods. So in this case, Plat actually does worse than the uncalibrated. Isotonic still does slightly worse. Um, and then beta calibrated improves on the uncalibrated. And spline calib does a little better than that. OK, so now it's your turn. So uh, I'm going to encourage you to pause the video or take a break here and take that same RF model too that you did all the reliability diagrams on, and now calibrate it using one or more of the methods above and compare the performances. Feel free to cut and paste uh, some of the cells from above, but, but think about the steps that you're doing so that you really understand it. And, and note that you might get very different results from what happened for the, the model I just showed, so don't let that surprise you.